we are in fall and definitely in allergy season and I can definitely feel it today. But aside from that, we are also back in the book of Genesis this week. Going to be going into Genesis chapter 26. And we're going to be looking further in what happens with Isaac, Rebekah, and Esau. Starting in verse 1 says, there was, And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Now there is some controversy as to whether there was one Abimelech or two. In the case of one, he probably in this chapter is going to suffer one of the worst cases of deja vu that I've ever heard of. And if there were two, then it is possible that the first Abimelech could have died and then his son took it, his son could have taken could have been born with the same name or taken the same name and then reigned as king. Kind of like the uh, term Pharaoh. And if this is a case of that, then the old saying that the apple does not fall far from the tree would hold so true. In verse 2 it says, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Now if you are wondering, saying, this sounds awfully familiar. It really does. When I sat there and I was reading the chapter, I'm like, this sounds so much like what God told Abraham. If you, without necessarily going back, actually back within the scriptures and rehashing anything that we've already, the points that have already been made, Take it to your mind and rewind back. Or it, those who are going to be watching online have the luxury of doing so. You can go back into the earlier sermons. And this sounds so similar to when God told Abraham, leave your father's house, leave your country, pack up, leave everything that you know, and go to a land that I will show you. This sounds so similar to that. But God told Isaac, Abraham's son, don't go into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, which is a lot of what like Abraham did. Well, well, that's exactly what Abraham did. He was a pilgrim. He was a sojourner. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries... And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all of these countries, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This is exactly the same thing he told Abraham. Then verse 5 says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So let's get this straight. God tells Isaac not to go to Egypt. Go to a land that I will tell you. After God's plan comes to fulfillment, then all nations will be blessed through his seed. Now, if you pay attention to what the Bible says and you read ahead into further on in the chapters, and you finish out Genesis, and you read Exodus, you will understand why that Isaac going to Egypt would be jumping the gun a whole lot. But God makes his promise to Isaac because of Abraham's faithfulness. And most people would say, well, what about Isaac's faithfulness? Wouldn't this depend a lot on his faithfulness? Well, yes, it would. But also, God is going to keep his promise to, to Abraham. 
He's going to keep his promise to Isaac because of Abraham's faithfulness. And he's doing this to remind Isaac of his father's faithfulness. He wants to remind Isaac to look back to what Abraham did. To the love and devotion, the obedience that Abraham had to God. And he wants to show Isaac that yes, I keep my promises. He wants to show Isaac that your dad was faithful. He trusted in me and his trust will not be in vain. And he's doing this in hopes that Isaac will have that same faith. Now this is very, very important because sometimes God says yes when we ask him for things. Sometimes he says no when we ask him for things. For things. But then sometimes he says wait. Sometimes he says wait. And as a person, as a human being bound to time, being bound in my knowledge of the universe and how that it works and what God has in store, sometimes, and, I, and you can say amen if you want to in your minds, but uh, sometimes when God says to wait, it's harder than being told no. And I don't, I'm not saying this to brag, but I'm going to tell from my own personal experience that when I got out of high school, outside of my salvation, the one thing that I treasured the most and the one thing that I wanted the most was family. I looked forward to becoming a husband and a father one day, and I asked God repeatedly to send me the right woman. Now, God works in His own time, and I wanted to rush Him. And that ended up very, very badly, but not a permanent bad thing. I've met a lot of women out there that, let's just say that they claimed to be members of the body of Christ and were not. But God in His due time and in His due season, He sent me the woman that I would marry in Brittany. I didn't have to wait as long to find Brittany as becoming a dad. <laughs> so it's, it's very, very interesting the way that God's time frame works. So... when we look at Isaac, we see a great example of God telling people to wait. He told Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. I will give you this land. You will have children as numerous as the stars. And yet he still had to tell, he still told Abraham to wait. Abraham, had, he didn't just have Isaac, he had multiple children. But when you think about it, Abraham directly having children, you could count them on your two hands. But their descendants became as numerous as the stars. God gave him the land, but he was a pilgrim in the land. He did not own the land. And just as he told Abraham to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. He's telling Isaac to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. And as far as looking to Abraham's faith for an example, and Isaac having that good example, this is why it's so important for parents to remind their children what God has done for them. And to remind their children that God works on His own time frame. And that God looked out for them 
and the good times and the bad. And if their children focus on God, keep loyal to Him, and trust in Him, that He will see them through the good times and the bad as well. But then getting into verse 6. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. If you see this big grin on my face, it's not there by accident. I cannot help but get this big grin and it's just because of the irony of the situation here. So let everybody wrap your minds around this. Here's Abraham says to Abimelech about Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Then here's Isaac, Abraham's son, saying to Abimelech, now keep in mind the controversy, we don't know if this is Abimelech's son or the same Abimelech, about his wife Rebecca, she is my sister. Wow. Like I said earlier, either this is a case of like father, like son, the apple not fall far from the tree, that is so wild, or else this is one of the greatest cases of deja vu that Abimelech would have had in his lifetime. But on the more serious note, when Abraham said that she is my sister about Sarah. He told a fib. He told a half truth. In other words, he told a lie. But he still told the truth. He told the truth in telling a lie. Because she was his half sister. But with Isaac, now this is just a flat out lie. She was his cousin. You know, as parents, we hope our children and grandchildren won't make the same mistakes as us. But if this chapter is any indication of anything, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do make the same mistakes as us. But you know what? You know what the beauty of this is? The beauty of this is that they can make the same, they, even though they may make the same mistakes as us, if they do, we can be the perfect example of repentance. We can be the perfect example of forgiveness. We can be the perfect example of God's love to our children. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm perfect. The book of Romans, chapter 3, says, For all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sin on us. And, not, and anyone else's sin is not any better or worse than mine. I have a responsibility to continually be cleansed by the blood of Christ just as anyone else. And I hope and pray that my son won't make the same mistakes as me. But if he does, I can be that example of love and forgiveness and repentance. And so parents, grandparents, if your children and grandchildren do make the same mistakes as you, 
Think about how that you can be the best example that you can be for them. Verse 8 says, And it came to pass that when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife. A different translation says that he was laughing with her. The term sporting, laughing here, uh, it would be better, it would be probably be better to translate that as flirting. He was flirting with his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac. He saw this. He called Isaac, verse 9, says, and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. And how saidst thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? He said this exact same thing to Abraham. He said, One of the people might lightly have lined with thy wife, and thou shouldst have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Speaking of a child making the same mistake as the parent, Isaac had the same thing that, to him that happened with Abraham, which was fear. He was afraid of the same thing Abraham was afraid of, that someone would kill him to take his wife. Now, this seems ridiculous to us today. And when we read Abraham's account, we think, oh, this is ridiculous. Someone killing you to get to your wife? But the fact that we read it here with Isaac leads the student of the Bible and the student of history to an interesting thought process. That both these men were afraid of the exact same thing. And in studying for this sermon, I came across a little, I came across a few articles about Canaanite culture and the Philistine culture of that time period. And there are many accounts, many reports that they had a Viking-like culture. And if you remember the Vikings that we hear about so much from Norse, uh, Nor uh, Nordic tales, rather Nordic accounts, that the Vikings would pillage, they would steal, they would murder. And so if they had that same type of culture, then Abraham and Isaac could have understandably been afraid of this same thing. Now while that same fear would be understandable, it would not be justified. The reason why I say it would not be justified is here you have the creator of the universe. You have the Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the King of kings. Who has made a promise to you. You have the very one who brought destruction upon the whole world with the great flood. And He's made you a promise. He's made a promise to you that in your seed all nations of the world of the earth will be blessed. Do you think He's not powerful enough to keep that promise? You know, there is a particular, or there are, not necessarily a particular, but there are a few denominations out there that still believe in the miraculous gifts. And when 
they hear us and they, they hear the truth being taught about the miraculous gifts and how the miraculous gifts have ceased, they like to say, you want to put God in a box. How dare you put God in a box? Acting like he's not powerful enough to do the miracles. When, and, and of course, if you think about it, they are the ones that are putting God in a box by saying that he has to have the miracles to convert someone today. They are the ones that are putting God in a box by saying that his word is not sufficient for our salvation. But then sometimes we in our set of our own minds put God in a box. We like to put God in a box when we worry about various things. When we worry about things that we shouldn't worry about. A prime example. A prime example is when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he told his followers, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. The Gentiles worry about such things. Now you have to remember that he, that he was Jew, talking to the Jews at the time, the Jewish culture. And to the Jewish culture, the Gentiles were pagans. The pagans worshipped false idols. In the Old Testament, the false God repeatedly made the point clear that there is nothing in idols, that they were powerless. These gods weren't even gods at all. There was nothing there. And so, excuse me, and so, what Jesus was essentially saying was that if you worry about your job, worry about your food, worry about your clothing, worry about this, that, and the other, the things that the people of the world worry about, then you're essentially acting just like the people of the world. You're acting like that there is no God. And then notice how Jesus summed it up. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Suddenly puts a new emphasis on what we noticed last week in the book of Ecclesiastes, to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. How dare we put God in a box? How dare we act that as if He is so powerless that He cannot ensure that a door or even a window is open for us to go through to see that our needs are met? God knows what you need and He will open up the door for you. Now, you have a responsibility to go through the door, but He will open the door for you. That's why I say that Isaac's fear was understandable, yet not justified. The same way that our concerns and our fears are understandable, but they're not justified. And I love Abimelech's reaction right there saying that he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then moving on into verse 12, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year 
a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great, and went forward, and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks, and possession of herds, and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So Isaac had become powerful. He had become rich. He was the envy of the town. When people talk about keeping up with the Joneses, he was his last name was Jones. And they envied him. And what's ironic is that, notice it says, for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, had stopped them, filled them with earth. They basically took the wells that Abraham and his servants had dug, they filled them with earth, and still, <coughs> his wealth and power increased. Now I tell you, Isaac at this point, he's probably eating a big, big, big piece of humble pie right now. Because here he was afraid that these people would kill him to take Rebecca, as if God could not prevent them from doing so. And yet here is God, despite the Philistines essentially stopping up the wells, still allowing Isaac's power and wealth to increase. Don't put God in a box. And of course, here's another thing is they envied him, but they were also afraid of him. They were afraid of him because he had power, he had wealth, he could have taken over the country if he wanted to. And they were afraid of it. And so notice what happens in verse 16. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. So they send him away and he goes to the old stomping grounds that his father had. He redug the wells. He called them by the same names that his father called them. And Isaac's servants, verse 19, digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek, because they strove with him. They digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. So here he had redug the wells. He dug the two new wells. And here are the herdmen. The herdsmen, the sheep herders, the goat herders, the cattle herders, saying, that water is ours. That water is ours. Now, if Isaac and, and Granted, I'm not making fun of American individualism when I say this, but if he was your average, everyday American that we have here in this country right now, he would want to sue or he would want to fight. But Isaac, being a man of God, noticed what he did. And he removed from thence and digged another well. For that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Rather than fight them, rather than get into a big argument and cause a whole bunch of trouble over some water, 
what does he do? He, he goes elsewhere. He digs another well that they don't fight over. And he's like, see, there's room for all of us. And the reason why that I say that is anticipation. The reason why I say it this way is because of anticipation. Halloween's coming up. After Halloween comes Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving comes Black Friday. And you watch how people want to get into fights over TVs and VCRs and the Black Friday special. I'm very well aware of what's coming up. They already have Christmas decorations in the stores. People acting like there's not enough to go around. There is nothing on this earth. There is nothing on this earth worth getting into such an argument over. And I talk about that in the realm of possessions. And people say, you don't have to tell us that, preacher. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. When I... I grew up in Memphis, and when I hear pe when I hear accounts of people shooting each other over a pair of sneakers, and I tell you, and here's the thing: what I I love preaching. I love the work of a preacher. It is the most rewarding work that there is. But being a preacher, I'm exposed to the dark underbelly. When I see people, when I see people that are supposed to be Christians betray each other, when I hear accounts of an elder and a deacon getting into a fist fight over whether there's carpet in a building or not, or the color of a carpet, yes, I do need to say it. I do need to say it. That there is, that it's not worth fighting like that over that. And then in verse 23, he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. And Abimelech went unto him from Gerar and Ahuzeth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there now be an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee. And let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Excuse me. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. So they made a peace treaty between Isaac and Abimelech just as it had been between Abraham and Abimelech. And verse 31 says, And they rose up betimes in the morning and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they digged, and they said unto him, We have we found water. We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba. Unto this day. And Esau was forty years old. And he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beeri the Hittite. And Bashemath 
the daughter of Elon the Hittite, the Hittite, excuse me, which were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago about marrying within your own nation? Yes, well, notice Esau took wives of the Hittites. They weren't of his own nation. And this grieved both Isaac and Rebekah. It was a grief of mind to them. When you marry someone that doesn't share the same values as you, you invite trouble into the marriage. We, it's interesting because we just got done noticing 2 Thessalonians, I remember uh, from Bible class, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Well, there was a 3, verses 14 and, uh, 13 and 14 as well. That, meant, that said about not keeping company with those who walk disorderly. I looked up the term about not keeping company with. And that means to mix up. When you think about it, it's like, think about a recipe that you're mixing up. I don't know, just pick anything. Macaroni and cheese. Once you put those cheese, you take that macaroni and cheese. You have your noodles, your macaroni noodles. You have your melted cheese, and you mix them together. Now try to get that cheese off of those noodles. <coughs> now what we have here is a principle that we can be friendly. And, and when you look at the whole chapter here, it's summing up a big point. That you can be friendly with people of the world. We can be friends with people of the world. We're, to, we're told to be pleasant and friendly to as many as we can. But we cannot be mixed up with them and be in fellowship with them. That is the point of this chapter. Now as far as not being mixed up, not having fellowship, it's not being bound to those of the world. Well, if you're not bound to the world, you're bound to Christ. And those who have bound themselves to Christ have done so by hearing the gospel proclaimed, Romans 10, 17, have believed the gospel, John 8, 24. They have repented of their sins, Acts 17, 30. They have pledged their allegiance to Christ publicly, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And they have been immersed, buried with Christ in baptism. Romans 6, 3, and 4, where they walk in newness of life. And we remain faithful unto death. Revelation 2, 10. Now if someone messes up, we talked about repentance in the chapter. About our children making the same mistakes as us. Well, this is where repentance comes into play. If we mess up in our walk, and trying to get to heaven. Then we can repent and ask for forgiveness as Simon, once known as the sorcerer, did in Acts 8.22. If anyone has need to respond to the Lord's invitation to either become a Christian or to come back home, we encourage you to do so while the rest of us stand and sing.